Hi. <clears throat> as, uh, as long as I can remember, I've always been fascinated by light. I've been uh, staring at light bulbs and uh, studying how light behaves my whole life. Uh, light is ubiquitous. It's in our houses. It's in our uh, homes. It's in our cars. It's on our cars. Uh, it's in our fridges. And uh, it's responsible for roughly 15% of the electrical consumption in North America. It has the power to influence our decisions. It affects our mood, our behavior. All too often, it's thought of in its utilitarian aspect. At its most basic level, we add light fixtures into rooms so we don't stub our toes, so we can see our tasks, so we can find the mustard in the fridge. But light as a medium can produce effects that are tr truly beautiful in their own right. And light really ends up needing to do both of these things. It needs to do its function, but simultaneously, like other materials, like wood, brick, glass, and steel, it needs to be sculpted into our buildings and carved into our things uh, with the same thoughtfulness. I'm suggesting that when you leave here today, that you consider light as a material. Light can be sculpted like any other material if you understand it. Um, let's start with an example that we're familiar with, like wood. If I wanted to make a wood chair, I would dream up what a wood chair, uh, you know, my taste of a wood chair. And then I would consider how it's made up of pieces and how those pieces would fit together. With light, the exercise is the same. Um, first, you would consider what you want to do. I want to make the image of a dog barking. And then you would start with the material, AKA the plane of light. And then you would consider how you would like to shape the light. And then knowing a little bit about light, you would realize that if you interrupted your hand in front of between the source and the light plane, uh, that you would get the image you wanted. And you could even take it one step further and wiggle your pinky and make him bark. What's important in this image is that we focus on what the light is doing and that it's the light that lands on the screen that's the material. Um, all too often, we focus on the source of light. And past that, it's about the, uh, the interaction between the source and the plane. There are four basic principles that will help you understand how to sculpt light. The first principle that I'll discuss is light is sharp and light is diffuse. On a uh, bright sunny day, the light that comes from the sun is considered sharp. But when a cloud jumps in front, it's diffuse. Um, all light sources usually can come in clear or frosted. Fluorescent is a little different. It's always, it's always frosted and diffuse. Uh, these are what I call window bow ties. Um, I don't know why, I've been photographing these for years. Uh, I think there's something really beautiful about how light is revealing something is imperfect. Um, these are reflections using sharp light of a window pane, but all window panes are slightly deformed uh, uh, because of uh, static pressure in the building, gravity, etc. And then they have this convex or concave effect and they create these, uh, what I call them window bow ties. Here is a uh, very rich image of diffuse light. Um, uh, the leaves that are closer to the screen are a sharp shadow, where the leaves that are a few feet away are diffuse. Any leaves that are six or eight feet wouldn't be visible. Uh, diffuse light creating shadow is a much more rich, and there's this uh, suggestion of even depth here. You wouldn't get this image if you were looking with sharp light. Second principle I'd like to talk about is that light reflects and light refracts. Light bounces off some surfaces and will also distort through and off imperfect surfaces and materials. Great example of this is light reflecting and refracting off of a water surface. The third principle, there's only four, light creates shadow. These shadows, when the source is the sun, will change during the day and even month to month. As we saw earlier with the image of the leaves, those shadows, when the light is diffuse, um, will, uh, will be sharp and more muddy. And the last principle I'll talk about today is that all light changes. 
Uh, don't be fooled, all light changes. From the sun, from its position into the sky, from its intensity, its sharpness, its color, to a candle towards its end of its life, even light bulbs, uh, they lose their uh, tungsten, become muddy, less efficient. We've all seen, we've all had headaches from fluorescent lights wheezing. The change of uh, skylight is probably the most severe from dark and warm to bright and cool and back to dark and warm again. It's these four principles that I'll focus on today and they really end up being tools for us to allow us to control and sculpt the light and treat it as a material. I'm going to look at these four principles and see how they apply on things that I've worked on, things that have inspired me, and uh, we'll talk about the specific t uh, principles inside of those. This piece here I call the empty light. Uh, I made this when I was a student. It uh, really celebrates diffuse light with a uh, two and a half foot PL lamp, compact fluorescent uh, in the middle, shrouded by a uh, fluorescent uh, skin. The, the, uh, the idea of the empty light is that you can fill it with whatever you want and it really masks what the object is on the inside um, and it takes everyday objects and I think makes them more exciting. Um, I, mean, I was a student, so I didn't have any money, so this is like a J cloth, post-it notes, dead light bulbs and foam S's. Um, the antithesis of this fixture would be this one, which I titled Spilt Milk. And this is just a very, very small, low voltage, uh, a very tiny, sharp light source that's placed inside a milk, milk jug. And all of this uh, wonderful effect is purely just the imperfections in the glass. Uh, and this is a demonstration of how sharp light can be celebrated, but also uh, refraction. When I was working as a lighting designer at uh, Gabriel McKinnon Lighting Design, uh, we had this idea of making a, a water light that would be interactive uh, with the uh, music in the, at the party, at our annual Christmas party. Uh, this was the concept, which was to take a speaker, between the speaker and a water table, we would have a light and that the speaker would, would move the uh, water table. So uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, before LEDs really took off. Uh, later on, uh, they, the original one was really a meter by a meter. It was 50 feet. LEDs didn't exist, so we had to use a very large light bulb to get those sharp, crisp shadows. Uh, now, with bright LEDs, I revisited this idea. And this, this is a cigar box with a guitar amp, a one-watt LED, a uh, Meccano set, and uh, this custom-built uh, Petri dish on top. And if you plugged your iPod into it, um, it makes its uh, powerful images of these standing wave geometric mosaic patterns that would blend in and out of each other. And uh, uh, the, big, the big plus for this was it was very small and portable. In 2009, uh, Mitchell F. Chan and I, uh, Mitchell F. Chan's my partner at Studio F Minus, were commissioned to do uh, interactive hanging pieces for Luminato's temporary art gallery. Um, we, uh, I guess at this time we were really exploring what shadow could do for light. And so we, we wanted to come up with a new idea. The first step was to look at how an object created a shadow. And then we started to play around and decided that we could manipulate the object by making the head very small and the legs very big, but still get the same pristine image. And then we took it, uh, the furthest step we could, which is just to make a mess of wire, but the, the wire itself would be very uh, precisionly made where anything towards the light, it would be very small bends and far away from the light would be very large bends. Uh, this is the concept. To make it a little more interactive, we added a proximity sensor hid hidden behind the canvas so as you approach the piece, it turns on. And then we have our LED, LEDs are great, um, then our uh, wire uh, mess there, and then our image. Uh, I like showing this image because this is how we spent our entire summer. It was a beautiful summer that year, and we spent it in a dark garage making our pieces. <laughs> we, uh, we decided we'd use Greek myth uh, mythology as a subject. 
the characters in Greek mythology seem to only be there to convey some sort of a story. And uh, they all have these wonderful objects that are attached to them. We had this question, would, would these characters even exist if there wasn't this burden or lesson? Um, this here is Sisyphus' boulder. And Sisyphus was given the mundane task of, you know, he did, you know, he wasn't very nice to the gods and he, they punished him by he has to push this boulder up the hill every day. So as you approach this piece, there's the wire mesh as part of the boulder. Uh, Sisyphus is re revealed uh, holding the boulder or pushing the boulder. Uh, Eurydice uh, is probably my favorite. It definitely took the most time and required both of our efforts. The story of Eurydice is that um, Orpheus was granted passage to Hades to collect her and bring her out, uh, provided that he didn't gaze on her. Uh, she's beautiful, of course, so he did, and she vanished. And so in addition to this representing the principles of sharp, of uh, the fact that light is, uh, creates shadow, uh, this uses, like the sun changes its position, uses this idea that light can change as well. And there's a motor here which pushes the light towards her, and then her image fades away. So you two are struck with the same conundrum that uh, Orpheus had, where you're trying to look at her, but the very product of looking at her uh, makes her disappear. And you can see here her image uh, falls off the screen. We uh, always had an ambition of doing this on the side of a building one day, so that at noon when everybody was eating their lunch, they would see the pristine image uh, uh, swoop in and then uh, take off again. This here is um, Canadian National War Memorial in Ottawa. It, it's a very humble example of what I consider one of the best architectural examples of good shadow use. Uh, Martin Comboy lighting design, and Martin Comboy himself worked on this piece. And from side profile, it's lit very well. The, the, sub, the soldiers coming home through the arch uh, are lit on 45 degree angles. Um, but when you come to the front, Martin Comboy's background is theater. And by cross-firing, by having the lights over here and here, by cross-firing the subjects, the, the soldiers are doubled, or are tripled actually, and he very skillfully deals with that hard line up here, which would be a very sharp uh, scallop of light, by uh, blurring it out. And it really is this idea that the fog is lifted, and the soldiers have come, many, many soldiers have come home. And this is a, a great example of how understanding light and understanding its, uh, this principle of shadow has made this piece better than when it's, I think this is far better than it being viewed during the day. Actually, I should also mention that the unknown soldier grave is perfectly framed uh, with a square uh, from across the street on an adjacent building 20 stories up. So a very skilled lighting designer. Um, David Ajay's Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver is a great example of mastering diffuse light. Uh, the building is this black ominous box where the black glass tints the light coming into the space. And then once inside, he's installed these diffuse acrylic panels, which, so when the light's coming in from the tinted glass, it then is cut down, and then it hits this uh, opal pl uh, plastic, and then it's just this nice, calm, muddy light that is the, serves as the general lighting for the space. And then these lights here focus on the artwork uh, just a wonderful piece, and it it also has this great side effect of being this great juxtaposition. When you enter this ominous black box, you come inside; it's warm and filled with light. Um, this is a picture of an indirect uh, light standard. Uh, these were really big twenty years ago. Uh, I should say ten years ago. Uh, they're still around. Um, and how this light fixture works is it's a sharp incandescent light source usually so that you don't see the hot spot of the light. Instead of it shining down like the cobra heads and the street lights that you see around the city, it shines up onto a surface and then spreads it out so that the hot spot you see is already large and then, uh, and then shines the light down. Uh, Ron Keyberg, the architect of his own home, of course, and uh, Gabriel McKinnon uh, Lighting Design work together 
to come up with this fantastic concept for a home, which is what if the entire ceiling of the home, which was uh, galvanized decking, was the, like the indirect fixture we just saw. The great advantage of this is that from plan, you have this one little uh, short wall where all the lights are. And then as you walk around the room, there's a light switch in your bedroom that turns on light number six. It's great because all your lights are in one spot. You never need a ladder and the entire ceiling is super clean. And it, it really makes the whole house a light fixture, a very innovative way of thinking about uh, using light, a true master. Uh, here's uh, some images of his living room and dining room table. The last example I'll talk about is Dream of Pastures. This is a piece I worked on with my art partner, Mitch. And uh, this one more or less embodies all of the things I've kind of talked about today and more that I don't have time to get into. Uh, the concept was to produce a interactive ride, a way to uh, enjoy a horse ride in the middle of the city. And this piece strictly uses light as a medium and a, as a material. Projected on the wall of the AGO, a rider would, or a participant would sit on this contraption and while he pedals or cranks, we didn't know at this time, uh, it creates this animation machine and it puts a, a shadow of him on a white lit horse. The terrifying thing about doing a concept before you figure it out is that you have to figure it out. That's, that's probably another talk. Um, so this is the animation machine. We used uh, ceramic metal halide lights. They're very bright and very sharp. Uh, in this instance, we would have had to use clear lenses or uh, clear bulbs, and then we laser cut these old-timey wood slides to create the image of the horse uh, over here. This is my father-in-law's 1970 exercise bike uh, with a generator that controlled the motor that ran the animation machine. And we even had a, uh, a Sony Sports Walkman, which I had to get from a pawn shop, uh, that controlled uh, some Philip Glass music to help the rider um, um, kind of put him in a quiet place because there were so many people. And this here, uh, I was actually very nervous about this, of getting a shadow on a lit object, but it ended up working out well. And uh, a, an important point to note here is one of the things I'm not, I don't mention today uh, is that uh, light is different. And this would have only worked by using this warm incandescent light juxtaposed against this cool light you can imagine if I didn't use two different colors that it would look like a camel had swallowed this guy. <laughs> and uh, this is all three pieces working together. And um, yeah, and so I have a quick video I'll show you of the piece. So I'd like to close with uh, what's next for light. Um, I've spent, as long as I can remember, I've been trying to get my head around how light really is not this, shouldn't be thought of as this utility, but as this material, and we really need to consider what the light's doing first. The, the irony is that now with LEDs 
and OLEDs, which stands for organic um, light emitting diodes, uh, the light fixture is the material. <laughs> so as frustrating as that is, because I seem to have just got my head around this other concept, I think it opens up these great new possibilities for a different way to think about uh, how we sculpt light. I mean, we literally get to have paper thin uh, video screens, uh, treat them as fabric, and do, what it, um, do whatever we want with them. Um, OLEDs uh, on a clear substrate are, uh, when they're off, are 85%, up to 85% clear. All of these options have the uh, ability to be touch sensitive. And in this bottom left corner is a, a product that Mitch and I are currently working with, which is called Sensacell. It works by capacitance touch, like a theremin. You don't even have to touch it, you just go near it and it interacts with it. So you can tuck it behind a, a clear material. So, and, and this is a project that's going in next November where we're uh, installing extremely large snowflakes where the default position is that they're on. And like a frosted window, when you, uh, when you go by and rub the snowflake, uh, the lights will turn off and you can write your name or a love letter or draw a heart. We're taking it one step further by hacking into the sensor cell to then, uh, when you are interacting with the large sculpture, you'll actually be controlling all the uh, already existing infrastructure lighting in the space and outside. So in closing, I hope that I've uh, convinced you or inspired you at least to think differently about lighting moving forward. Um, in today's environment with energy consumption, a very high priority, whether it comes to your cell phone or your laptop or, or to energy consumption in buildings, um, lighting seems to um, kind of be given a short end of the stick. Uh, regulations like LEED are extremely important to get our energy consumptions down, but all too often I, I fear as though it runs the risk of coming at a cost of, uh, uh, of, of the, the, the beauty and the qualities of light that I've come to enjoy and uh, focusing too much on uh, allowing us to see and have access to our mustard. And uh, we, we, must, we must not lose sight that light can do both these things and it, uh, and it really should. Thank you.